Hi, I'm Jenna. And I'm Erin. And welcome to Between Two Filing Cabinets, where we bring you tips, trends, troubles, and stories from HR. And this week, we might look a little bit different because Erin and I are actually not together. Um, we're in two different locations, but we still wanted to uh, record an episode uh, this week and focusing on trust. That's right. So we've got some more uh, what not to do awards, and we had a lot of runners up regarding trust this week. Jenna, you want to lead us off with some of the highlights? Sure. Yeah, we had uh, one example uh, came in from... Uh, someone who was fired from their job for allegedly trying to poison their coworker with their spicy food. Uh, turns out um, that the coworker was actually eating their other coworker's food for whatever reason. It wasn't actually meant for that coworker. Nonetheless, they were accused of trying to poison that coworker. Sounds like the company didn't do a very thorough investigation because it fired the employee who. Uh, brought in that spicy food. So essentially, coworker stole their coworker's food out of the fridge, thought it was too spicy. Yep. And so obviously, that must be their coworker trying to poison them. Trying to kill them. Yeah. Okay, good yeah. trust. <laughs> a little lack of trust when you actually fire that. Doesn't sound like they did a very thorough investigation on uh, that one. No. Um, another one, an employee was uh, had cancer and was at their chemotherapy appointment and uh, their supervisor tracked them down while receiving treatment uh, to ask them a whole slew of things about work. That's terrible. Yeah. How did they even know that they were at chemo treatment? Yeah, you know, they kind of had forced one of uh, another employee to disclose where this employee was um, and that coworker that did um, you know, apologize to the coworker that was receiving treatments, but they really felt like I had, that they had no choice, um, but to disclose that they were being pressured by that supervisor to be like, tell um, me where they are. I need to get in touch with them. Yeah. So that's terrible. Trying trust on many levels in, in that one. Yeah. Aaron, and some legal issues as well. <laughs> <laughs> you legal issues, some HIPAA violations, probably. Yeah. Uh, family leave, probably who knows? Uh, Erin, you had a, a, another interesting one that you uh, wanted to talk about. Yeah, I thought it might, it might be an interesting one to unpack a little bit when it comes to kind of uh, spying in the workplace. So this supervisor decided it would be a good idea to invade, um, install a hidden surveillance camera. Um, it made, he made it look like he was installing a motion detector. And instead, he had a camera inside it to spy on um, employees that he thought were not, um, that were, thought were goofing off uh, while during work time. And one person, I guess, was caught doing a crossword and was fired um, from being, you know, spied on without, without their knowledge. So ah, it was a video camera. It was a video camera. It was a video camera, again, made to look. <laughs> <laughs> like a motion detector, almost like one of those nanny cams. Spoiled again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it got me thinking, though. Um, well, one is that legal, right? Yeah. So it really depends upon what state you are in when you're recording uh, things. So, um, and it depends upon how you're recording uh, things. Mm. So, in Oregon, for the most part, if you're doing video surveillance, you don't need. Um, in public areas, you don't need consent. So assuming that this employer was uh, recording the work area, which it sounds like that, that was the case, they don't need to give consent to just do the video recording. Now, if there was audio attached to that, then they would have to have consent um, of those peoples to have that recording. So Oregon's an interesting one because if it is um, a telecommunication electronic recording, it just requires um, one person to consent. So if, uh, for example, if I was, I was on a phone call with someone, mm. I could record that call without telling them that they're being recorded. That's just in Oregon because mm. I'm the consenting party. Now, if I were to meet that person in, in person and we were to have a, a live conversation, Oregon law says both parties have to be informed that they're being 
recording okay. for that video and then the audio side of things. And there are some exceptions to that, but that's the general expectation. So when you're adding audio, that really is sort of where you up it. And then there are other exceptions, you know, um, you know, you can't record in any place, um, video or audio where people have a reasonable expectation of privacy, privacy. So things like, you know, a bathroom, a locker room, those types of, uh, things. There's, um, some question about, let's say you are in your office at work mm. and you have the door closed and it's not an office where there are people coming and going. It's kind of your own office. You control who's coming and, and going. Um, so there's some legal issues about whether you would have a reasonable expectation of privacy in your own office. Wow, that's so interesting. I would have thought that it was just whether or not you were filming in that person's office, regardless of whether that door is open or closed, because it's not really, you wouldn't think of it as necessarily a, a common area or a public area. But I can see how that door closure, I guess you're walking by, it would affect your expectation of privacy. Right, but that's, that's all part of the argument. Is the door open? Is the door closed? You know, so, there, so there's so many sort of legal risks associated with that. And, you know, we've had it, had it come into um, you know, play with members who they've been in a disciplinary meeting with an employee and the employee has their phone in their pocket and they're recording everything. And um, it's an in-person conversation, which means that's an illegal recording mm. because if that supervisor doesn't have, or the other party, whoever mm. it is, doesn't, isn't informed that they're being recorded, that's a violation of the law, probably would not also be admissible in any sort of um, court proceeding. But it is, I think it's becoming more common where employees are doing those sorts of things of like, hey, I'm going into this meeting, I'm just going to hit record on my phone. Um, so I have a record uh, of that. And so, you know, I, I tell employers in those types of situations, especially if it's something where it's contentious, or you're doing an investigation or anything like that, have people take out their phones and turn them off so that you can, you know, see that that phone is off because I definitely think it is a risk for um, employers. Um, yeah. And at that point too, the trust is probably already kind of eroded. If you're getting to that point in the investigation, that's not going to be your first and foremost concern. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, and it just happens. I mean, it probably happens more than supervisors are even aware. And a lot of times I will have people that are like, oh, I wouldn't have even thought to ask that person to, you know, turn off their phone. But I think, yeah, I mean, especially if you're doing a confidential investigation, it's probably a good practice to just have like, hey, because of confidentiality issues, we need to have you take out your phone, turn it off just while you're participating, you know, as a, as a witness or any of those sorts of things, just to protect the information. That makes sense, being transparent about it so that people aren't speculating that it's about them or take it personally. So Jenna, what are some other rights that employers have in regards to surveillance? So I know a lot of times people will kind of inquire as to whether they can kind of snoop on someone's Facebook yeah. or um, whether they can check employee emails. Um, yeah. So what are some of the parameters there? Yeah, so Oregon also has some specific laws about uh, that. Um, so for example, you can't uh, require anyone to turn over their um, password or require access to a social media account. Mm -hmm. So arguably, so what might happen is let's say you, you've you want to spy on Facebook, uh, you know, on someone maybe that you supervise or something like, like that. Um, they really sick that day. <laughs> really, yeah. Are you, are you at the beach or mm -hmm. I think I hear waves back there. Uh, yeah. So let's say you, you want to check on that. You're, you're not friends with them on Facebook. And so you ask one of their coworkers like, Hey, can you give me access to your social media account so I can go in and look? That would probably be a violation of Oregon's law, which says you can't require someone to ha um, provide you access or turn over their um, password, let alone, you know, again, the trust side of things of that of like, do you really need to do that? If you're if you're questioning it, why don't you have a conversation with them? There's something that's leading you to question that just have a conversation. Um, and then uh, I lost my train of thought about some other oh, just email can people go and yeah. read emails i know that that's something that i'm pretty sure it's not they do have a right employers do have a right to check emails. right and, and there's some 
there's some gray area about what type of email. So if it's company email, hopefully you have a policy in your handbook that says, hey, anything that you access is company property. So if you're using your computer to access our networks, our files, and right, all of that is considered company property, we're monitoring it and we have discretion to go in and look at things. And so if it is things like your work email, you know, or your work phone, um, those things are pretty easy to say, yeah, we've got a good policy that says this is not private. You don't have a reasonable expectation of privacy. We are monitoring this and we can look at all of those records mm -hmm. where it gets into a little bit more of a gray area is if someone's accessing like their personal email on a work computer. And so you kind of, because it's a fairly complicated legal issue, I would say if an employer ever felt so inclined that they needed to go and look at someone's personal email that they had accessed using um, company property, that they would probably get some legal advi advice about whether they really should be doing that, um, if it's really necessary, or perhaps they can get the information um, elsewhere. And so those kind of rules also apply to phones, not just computers, really any of that company um, property. And again, when you have sort of mixed use um, devices, maybe it's your personal phone, but you have your work email on there. You know, there's certainly some issues um, that, that go along uh, with that. But one of your best defenses is just make sure you have a really clear policy that says, hey, if you're using these things for work purposes, you don't have a reasonable expectation of privacy. We will monitor it and you might have to turn over those records. That way there's no question. And then whether you really can access some of those, some of those things where there's that kind of private um, mix that they're using for personal, we can deal with that later, but we want to make the expectation clear up front. Right. No, and that seems to be kind of the main main takeaway. I mean, there's a lot of good reasons for surveillance. It could be safety. It could be, you right. know, security reasons. And it sounds like, especially from what you're saying, that transparency is key as far as stating what those expectations are, letting people know, and letting people know why that surveillance is there in the first place so that they yeah. don't speculate as to yeah. why. You know, and in general, you know, with the video, because there's a little bit more flexibility with the video, I still say put put up notices to let employees know, hey, this area is under surveillance so that they have that expectation. They know, you know, there are limited exceptions. Let's say, yeah, you, someone you think is stealing from the company and you don't know who it is. And so we're going to put up some surveillance and not tell anyone about it. Kind of like in that scenario that you were talking about a while ago, you know, with the motion detector, but not for the, just the purpose of like, what are you guys up to? I want to make sure that you're working, mm. but versus, Hey, we have a legitimate problem here and we think someone's stealing from the company. So we're going to put up secret surveillance. That's just video, not audio. We're not going to tell anyone about it because we want to catch who's doing that. Those should be really limited um, circumstances when you do something like that. Yeah. The best policy air. And like you said, is, is that transparency upfront? So you're going to be engaging in that, make sure people have notice. It's so interesting and things are changing so fast. Like for instance, if we were in person and you were recording without my knowledge, we would have, we would have a problem, but because we're talking via, you know, uh, via virtual technology, yeah. you can. So it, it, it is really just fascinating um, yeah. how technology is changing this and how our expectations of privacy are even changing. Right, and each state is different as well. So some states have even phone conversations that you have to have, um, you have to inform the second party uh, of that. Whereas Oregon, it's just that one person um, consent. So each state is a little bit different uh, as well. Interesting, good thing we're both in Oregon right now. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, right. Well, uh, what should we file this one under? Wow. Trust? Trust and surveillance, how about? Surveillance. All right, we're going to file this one under trust and surveillance, and we will see you next time. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks.